Okay. Hi again. Um, again, my name is Andrea and I am the Recruitment and Admissions Officer for the Faculty of Information. Um, thank you all again very much for attending today's meet and greet event. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. I just wanted to say congratulations to everybody um, for being admitted to the Faculty of Information and we cannot wait to meet you in September. Um, so I just want to go over some um, a few housekeeping um, items before we uh, pass it along to some of our speakers um, and go through the agenda today. So this session is being recorded and we will be sharing the recording with everybody after the event. We will also be sharing the recording with people who are unable to attend the event. Um, so um, uh, just keep an eye on your email and, and you'll be receiving that recording um, for the session because we do have a lot of people joining us today. Your cameras and um, your cameras and volume um, uh, settings have been disabled just so that it's not so distracting um, throughout the presentation. But if you do have a question, um, you are able to ask your question through the chat feature um, that you'll find on, on uh, your Zoom display there. And that chat message will go directly to the host um, of the event. And then we will um, respond to your questions then. But I do please ask you, please do not ask a question until the presenter has finished speaking as the question that you might have will likely be answered through the presentation. Um, so please wait for the presenter to, to finish speaking and then you can ask a question if you do have any questions um, after each presenter has finished speaking. Um, the other thing I wanna note here is, um, the uh, live transcripts and captions are also available with this session. So to enable this or disable them, you can click the live transcript button in your Zoom meeting menu. Um, so the CC button, um, and that's available as an option as well. Um, so I'm going to go over and start off with the agenda. So we are going to start off with a uh, welcome note from our amazing assistant Dean, Stephanie Rose. And then we're also going to hear um, a nice welcome message from our Dean, Wendy Duff. Um, and then after that, we're gonna hear from our senior careers officer, Chioma Ekpo, and she's going to talk about the experiential learning opportunities that are available within the Faculty of Information. Um, and then I'm gonna go over some next steps with you. Um, so in the email that um, you were um, given um, to invite you to this event, there was a link uh, to join the um, admissions hub for uh, prospective and incoming students. In that link is where we're going to share this document. It's a next steps document. Um, just wanna... um, so this document right here will go through Basically, everything that I'm going to talk about today in today's presentation about your next steps will be outlined in this document for you to be able to take home um, or to refer back to after today's session. So don't worry if you've missed anything. Um, um, I, all the information will be listed here in this next steps guideline. Okay. Back to this presentation. So then after that, we're going to have um, one of our um, ambassadors take you on a virtual tour of the iSchool. And then we're going to hear from our current students through a student experience panel. Um, and then we're going to break off into breakout groups afterwards. So you'll have an opportunity to speak to other students who've been admitted to the program, um, as well as speak one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, with some of our current students as well. Um, so we'll, we'll enable those breakout sessions a little later um, and then you can join any of those groups that you're interested in, in joining. So without further ado, I would like to pass it on to our um, assistant dean, Stephanie Rose, to provide you with a welcome. Good morning, everyone. I understand you can hear me since I can see the closed captioning, captioning my words at the bottom of the screen, which is pretty phenomenal. Although I don't know that you can see me. So I did brush my hair in, in <laughs> hopes of you being able to see me and I'm welcoming you here today. But I do have to say it does look a little bit better there where we actually had hairstyles since salons open in the Toronto area and someone helped me look that good. 
<clears throat> oh, you can see me. Thank you, Chioma. Well, <clears throat> I want to welcome you. I know it's been a tremendously unique year uh, when you guys were all applying to the program. It's been the most competitive group of applicants we have ever seen in the history of the program. There has been a 100% increase in some areas. And so just knowing that you've been accepted to the program should make you feel as though that's a tremendous accomplishment. We have diversified our applicant pool. We have diversified the ways in which we assess applications to ensure that we're getting a rich community here in the Faculty of Information. Additionally, through the year of online learning and remote learning, we have learned what things like social distancing are or hard pants. Didn't know that was a concept until this past year. So when we're back on campus this coming fall, I suspect we all, be, we all will be wearing pants, whether they be hard pants or sweatpants. Those are your decisions. But the other decisions I hope you're continuing to make are the excitement that you have about what the kinds of what kind of courses you can be taking here in our program. As you know, we really value the diversity of opportunities here in our faculty and the richness of our students, whether you come from statistics or business, whether you come from psychology or the classics, book history or architecture. What makes our faculty rich and unique is the diversity of thoughts and ideas, the diversity of ways of thinking, diversity of students and their experiences. And we really believe that that's why you would choose to study with the Faculty of Information, not only the world-class ranking for the University of Toronto. When looking at the opportunities this coming year, we have more admissions, um, more admissions awards than we've ever had in the history of the institution. And we've had awards that are identified for more unique populations in, in doing that. Additionally, the faculty specifically has spent over a million dollars through the course of the pandemic to support remote learning. And our faculty have really been able to grow and develop a richness in their teaching, which we know will continue even when we're back on the campus. So I think you're coming into the faculty at an amazing time where learning has been diversify to reflect multiple ways of learning, multiple ways of knowing, and that's only going to continue as we incorporate new roles in our faculty, like our universal design for learning professional and our equity, diversity, inclusivity officer. I think you'll find, again, that the richness in our faculty is what makes the learning opportunity so incredible, and we welcome you, and we hope that you'll choose to join us here in the fall if you haven't already done so. As you'll notice in the information that's being provided today, we are going to start offering a variety of programming over the summer. Things that will help you experience the orientation program, but not all at one time, but instead spread it out. The other thing I'd like to note is, especially if you're joining us from an international location today, I highly recommend you get that student visa processed as soon as possible. And we have heard from the IRCC, which processes those visa documents, that times have, been, have dramatically decreased and so students who are applying at this time should absolutely have those documents processed. Additionally, the Faculty of Information and the University of Toronto are committed to having our students who are outside the country enter into the country by sponsoring quarantine programs. If you have additional questions about any of those things, I know our Center for International Experience would be thrilled to help you with that process. Finally, I just wanna say welcome. Thank you for choosing to join us and thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us here today. We hope that we'll be able to answer all of your questions. And for those of you who have unique ones and we need to be working with you independently, feel free to reach out to us one-on-one uh, -on -one, and we will make sure that those are resolved and answered for you. So from the bottom of my hard pants, I guess you could say, I wanna say welcome. And we look forward to having you join us here in the faculty in the fall. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, so now we're gonna hear from our Dean um, who has a message for you all as well. Hopefully you can hear. It's muted. Um, it, sorry, no one's able to hear the video? Not yet. Oh, I can hear it on my end. Um, Still nothing? I, I think I know what happened. Uh, if let me let me uh, share my screen. 
I thought it could be fun if we just play a game and we try and guess what she's saying, but that might not actually hit the point of what she really <laughs> is saying. But it could be fun if we really get, you know, no results. Uh, Andrea, could you could you try restarting your screen share and clicking the share audio button on the bottom left? Um, so stop share. Yep. Okay. So when you're pressing share screen at the pop-up that shows up, there's a button that says share audio in the bottom left. I don't have that button. Okay, no problem. I will share my screen for this part and then we can continue after. and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Information. First, I wanna congratulate you for being admitted to the program in a very competitive year. I hope you are proud of yourself because we are very proud of, that we have such a large, talented and ambitious group of students joining us come September. The coming academic year, 20, 21, 2022, is going to be very different than the academic year that has just come to an end. The academic year that just came to an end was completely online. That will not be true for next year. Because everything we're hearing from the U of T experts is that vaccination is a total game changer. We are not at all in the same situation we were a year ago. Practically, that means that we will have campus activities starting in the fall. Some classes will be in person, some will be online. Looking ahead for the winter term, we're expecting a situation with very few restrictions for in-person gatherings. It is gonna be a unique back to school experience and I'm really looking forward to it. To meeting you in person, to getting together in the Inforum, that's our gathering space for <laughs> lots of social events even if our numbers are limited at first. To check out our new podcasting facilities that have been set up during the pandemic and actually even our filming studio. And I'm even looking forward to the donuts that one of the managers sometimes brings to us every once in a while to share. I imagine for a while we'll be really thrilled just to experience the little things that we used to take for granted. At the same time, many people have told me that not everything about the pandemic was negative. I've had emails and talks from both students and professors who found genuine advantages to online learning. And as we move ahead, the faculty, that's something we'll think about. How do we integrate some of the most positive aspects of this last year's experience and what we've learned into our curriculum and activities? We have iSkill workshops. Maybe many of those should stay online. This is a tr truly a transformative time to be joining the Faculty of Information professions. Innovation is in the air. People and organizations both on campus and off are fundamentally rethinking the way they work. And you can be sure that a very important element of that is information, technology, and people. You are in for an exciting time here at the faculty. We all are. We are committed to helping everyone take advantage of the current opportunities. As you begin your studies at the Faculty of Information, I also want you to know that one of the things I like most about my job is hearing from students. Whether you have suggestions or questions, or even if you're disappointed by something, your perspective is always so valuable to me. We are entering uncharted territory as we return to campus. So let me share our maps and compasses and insights with, let, so let us share our maps and compasses and insights with each other as we navigate our way through the end of the pandemic and into the post COVID world of information. Welcome. And I hope you cannot wait to meet you come September.
Great, thank you very much um, to uh, Wendy Duff. We are very, very lucky to have her on as Dean for the next two years. So as your students here, um, she will continue to be our most fabulous Dean. Um, and thank you, Joshua, for, um, for sharing your screen so that we could see um, her message. Okay, so now moving on, I'd like to introduce our Senior Careers and External Out Outreach Officer, Chioma. Um, and she's going to uh, take over the presentation for now. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, welcome. Uh, it's, it's nice to, to have this opportunity to connect with you. Um, I'm gonna be talking about our Career Services Unit and um, the different programs that we offer to, to support you in your professional development journey while you're with us at, at the faculty. Next slide. Thank you. So we've got a range of career services that we offer um, and it's, it's the standard list of, of support and services. So it's your resume preparation, your cover letter writing, how to present yourself confidently and comfortably in an interview, how to network with people in your profession, how to recognize the network that you have and take advantage of those uh, relationships. We've got a, a robust iSkill workshop lineup as well that allows you to develop additional professional skills. We've got an amazing job shadowing program that is supported by our alumni community. And with that program, you have a chance to learn about our alumni in their, uh, in their sectors you know, and how they came to map their own career journey. Um, and we also have our own connections within our own faculty, uh, a rich and extensive and dynamic uh, database of employers and partners that are interested in supporting our students and interested in bringing our students on board to leverage their talent, to improve their own businesses and operations. And so all of these services really are delivered to allow you to begin to comfortably articulate what it is that you want to see in your career path going forward, right? Um, and so it's, you know, learning what your professional narrative is, what is unique to you, not what is unique to somebody else, right? But what is unique to you and your own value system, your own interests, your own skills, and the type of experience that you want to have. Um, and so all these services uh, will be available to you um, so that you'll be able to take advantage of the programs that we have to offer. Next slide. So this is a list of our rich work integrated learning programming and there's something for everyone. They are optional. Um, you don't have to participate in these programs. Um, and so, you know, we can help you make that assessment if any of these programs are right for you, but they are available. Um, and I'm gonna walk through each of them to just give you a brief overview of what they entail. So we've got the co-op program and our co-op program is a paid program. Our students are able to go on a co-op for two terms. So it could be, or rather it could be one term or two terms. It really depends on what you're interested in. And it's open to all students uh, in the MI program. It's available after your first year. And so our students apply to be in the program during their first year. Uh, and then we work with them during that year to prepare them for the competitive application process so that they're able to secure co-op positions in the summer term and in the fall term. We also have our talent program, and that is a two-year program that is available as soon as you come into the, the faculty. And it allows you to develop experiences within the library system at the university. It is a paid program as well. Uh, there is an application process. Uh, for that program as well. Uh, it's, it's quite a dynamic uh, program, particularly because of the length. It's a two-year program um, and you're devoting 15 hours a week for that two-year period. 
We also have our practicum program for our MI students. And that is, uh, it's an unpaid experience. Um, and there are two different practicum options that are available to you. You can have, you can participate in the 45 hour practicum or the 105 hour practicum. And with this practicum, we have a rich lineup of partners within the university and external to the university that submit some really exciting projects that they'd like our students um, to participate in. Um, so it's, it's another rich option uh, for our students uh, to consider. And it is available after your first year. And last but not least, uh, we have our internship program that is available to our museum study students. Um, and in this program, we, we have partners from the, from the GLAM sector that are interested in bringing our students on board to, to help them with their operations, to help them you know, with their archive work and, and just a whole host of um, experiences and, and duties that come you know, throughout this program. They are, there are paid and unpaid opportunities in the internship program. Um, part of our message to our employers is that we want to encourage employers to pay our students uh, through the internship program to recognize, you know, their talent and the labor that they are bringing to the world. Um, and so that's why we have some paid and unpaid opportunities through this internship program. And it is available after your first year and after your second year. So you can see there's quite a range of programs to, to consider. Um, and you don't need to be overwhelmed by the options. This is where we come in and, um, and work with you to, to help you understand what works best for you. Um, now, don't worry about the, the eligibility requirements. Don't worry about the process to get in. All that information will be available um, as we get closer uh, to the year. We'll be holding information sessions uh, to make sure that you have the information that is right for you so that you can make a decision on what program you want to participate in. Um, that's why you can leave this, you can leave this slide. Uh, just three things to think about. You know, when we look at, when we look at those internship programs, the co-op program, the talent program, and the practicums, um, they're really designed so that our students can clarify their career goals, right? And just be clear about what type of experience you want to be part of, you know, as you begin to chart your career journey. It also helps you to clarify what you don't want to do as well, right? You can, you can think, okay, you know what, that co-op job, now I know this is not the type of environment that works for me. Or you, you know, may realize, I don't like working with this type of manager, right? It just doesn't quite suit my work style, right? So, you know, all these experiences are very, very important because they also tell us what we don't enjoy and what we don't want to do in our future. And then most importantly, it also gives you the opportunity to develop, you know, a range of professional competencies, um, a range of, you know, skills, experiences so that you can feel comfortable, confident in, in thinking about, you know, where you want to go, right? Um, so it's, it's really a robust lineup of programming that we have. Um, just talking about the faculty, you know, I'd like to also add that in our faculty, we've got an amazing support community, um, just like our Dean was saying earlier on. Um, you know, if there is something that I don't know, I know I can reach out to, you know, staff, I can reach out to Andrea, I can reach out to Joshua. So, you know, you, you never have to feel like, you know, you're not going to get the answer. You'll get the support you need. We'll be working together with you along the journey to help you clarify some of your goals, uh, which we'll be doing by, you know, posing a lot of questions to help you get to that point. So here are some examples of uh, the careers that our alum um, are in. And this is just a really small, <laughs> small picture of, of what we have. Um, I'm hoping that um, by the time you come on board in September, we'll be able to provide a list of partners that support our students in, in a range of ways uh, so that you can start to think about where, where it is that you want to explore, what particular industry, what type of roles, you know, even what type of organizations, you know, all that, so that all of that aligns with your own value system and, and your interests going forward. 
So on that note, we look forward to having you on board. Don't stress about anything. Um, as we plan for the fall um, term, we're really hoping that we will be on campus. Uh, and, and so we look forward to working with you closely. It has been a challenging year um, for our career services unit in terms of you know, opportunities, but our numbers have been great. Our partners have been highly supportive. You know, they've they found ways to onboard our students, you know, in a remote work culture, uh, which is incredibly encouraging. And so we're going to take all that success and expand it and, and enhance it, you know, for our incoming group uh, in the fall term. So we look forward to having you. Have a great day. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That's great. Okay. Um, so what we can do is if you do have a few questions, we'll take a couple questions right now if you had any for Chioma, um, and uh, we can have some of those answered, answered and then we can move on to the next part of our presentation. And yes, exactly. Um, we also have Stephanie Rose here as well, if you have any questions for her as well. Okay, we have a few questions coming in. The first one is, who would we reach out to if we want to learn more about one-on-one -on -one sessions? Is this what one type of one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Chioma. Uh, I was gonna ask, what type of one-on-one -on -one sessions? Career sessions. Oh, career sessions. Okay, that that would be that would be me. And uh, how should they reach out to you? Do you have an email for them? Yes, <laughs> my email. I'll type it here. Is it the careers.iSchool email that they? Should school. Send we, to? We've got several. Um, okay, I'm mm -hmm. gonna post it. So I, I'm gonna find it so I don't mistype it. Okay, yeah. keep the questions coming. Sure. And the next one is, I'm curious to know if there's any opportunity for international exchanges or learning opportunities for grad students. There are actually this year, um, this year for the fall, which would be your first term with us, we have been told just as of yesterday, that the um, outgoing exchanges would be suspended for any in person activities for fall of 2021. Um, so if you're looking to do an exchange your first term with us, we would only be enabling students to do that if it was a remote learning opportunity. Um, however, we have um, seen more and more students um, pursuing um, outbound exchanges, actually, and inbound exchanges for that matter. So absolutely, there is an opportunity to do um, outbound exchanges. So that would mean, of course, you going somewhere else, uh, just not in the fall. We're waiting, of course, to make sure that uh, the pandemic um, or the risk that we're, we're putting our students at is minimized. So again, it would be only online or remote learning opportunities that you'd be able to pursue in the fall of 2021. And then after that, we would assume those will um, start to open up a little bit more as we know more of the direction of the pandemic. Hey, thank you, Steph. So we are going to answer uh, two more questions for now. There's a lot, uh, but we will we'll have more time for questions in the breakout sessions afterwards. And of course, you are free to email us at the emails mentioned <laughs> if they're not addressed by then. But we will we will be taking these questions down as well. And uh, if you go on our admissions sub at a later point, you can try to create a page which can answer these questions as well. Okay. So the next question is. Uh, hi, Chioma. I was just wondering if you had any examples of what exactly a practicum looks like, as in what kind of projects are st students typically assigned to? Okay, great question. Um, let's see. A, a really popular one has to do with um, website overhauls, right, because a lot of websites are really kind of ugly. Uh, and so our um, our, our faculty is known for its robust UXD program. And so a lot of our internal partners, especially on campus, 
you know, look to our students to, to help them refresh their website and help to uh, re-energize their branding. So that is an example of, of a practicum um, that, that can be submitted. Um, the interesting thing about the practicums is, you know, our students have a chance to review the selection that comes in and, and they decide which practicum aligns with their own interests. And um, if you're concerned about, well, how do I choose, you will have guidance from the practicum course instructor, you know, to help you better decide. But it's an interesting process. It's flipped. So it's not the employer selecting you, it's the student selecting the employer's um, project. But it also means that you have to be clear about what it is that you want to participate in, what type of experience and skills that you want to gain um, during this, during this um, practicum experience. It's, it's a very um, popular um, opportunity. Uh, um, I was just amazed about how many interests, you know, inquiries kept coming in for the practicum projects. Um, it, it's it's quite a range. Um, it's yeah, it's it's a range of projects. I just gave you that one example just to uh, give an idea of how um, how common the the project can be in terms of what what problem you're trying to solve. I hope that helps. Thank you, Chioma. And the last one for now, and again, we'll compile the rest and answer them on, on our admission sub later, is to Steph. I will need to scroll back up to find it. Uh, what are the quarantine programs as mentioned by Steph Rose? Uh, absolutely. So I do recommend you reach out to the CIE, which is the Center for International Experience for the specifics. But what I do know is after you've completed the uh, mandatory hotel stay with the uh, government regulations, they actually will sponsor, meaning it's free, <laughs> sponsor equals free, um, sponsor your two week quarantine in a either hotel or residence hall uh, for our international students coming into the country. And so that's something, yep, thank you, Josh. You posted the student life uh, link to the CIE. But what that means is they will actually pick you up from the hotel where you are required to stay once you fly into Toronto. They will pick you up and take you to the quarantine location and then provide you with food and, uh, and shelter for the remainder of that uh, two week quarantine at no cost to you. The other thing that we're encouraging students to do in regards to that quarantine is because we're starting our orientation programming and our iSkills programming in July, I believe, or early August, you actually are encouraged to come into the country earlier than just at the beginning of the term. So we can spread things out. We know we have about 20 to 30,000 students that we expect to be coming in from all around the world for the University of Toronto campus. And then we also know there are multiple campuses in Toronto, uh, Ryerson, York, you know, variety of others who will also be welcoming international students into the country. Not that they are part of our quarantine program, but the more that we can spread out the arrival of the students, the uh, probably the easier time you'll have and the more time you'll have to acclimatize to Toronto. And so that being said, definitely look into the CIE department for that quarantine support and then get yourself signed up uh, once you have your student visa and your travel arrangements put in place. Hopefully that answers it, but again, definitely check in with the CIE for uh, specifics around supporting and getting enrolled in their program. Okay, great, thank you very much. And again, um, don't worry if your questions weren't answered, there will be an opportunity for you to ask them, uh, some more questions during the breakout sessions afterwards. Um, so now I'm gonna move on to the next part of our presentation, just to uh, kind of keep up with our time here. Um, that's me, obviously. Um, I'm going to go through some of your next steps. And again, this will be provided for you in the admissions hub that Joshua also mentioned uh, a little earlier. So if you haven't already done so, uh, please sign and return your offer letter. Um, you have with you have four weeks from the date of your offer to respond to your offer. Um, and so we will accept um, those responses electronically through admissions.ischool at utoronto.ca. Um, and so if, again, if you haven't done that already, you can do it through there. 
Um, the tuition deposit, the $500 tuition deposit is due on June 1st. You can only pay that through credit card. So you would log into your Acorn account, and I'm going to talk about that a little later. Um, and you would pay by credit card only. Um, if you are a U of T student, you're probably used to paying your tuition through the bank um, or other, um, or other uh, payment uh, ways or options. Um, if you do pay it that way, it will not count towards your deposit. Um, so just keep that in mind. The only way um, to pay your deposit um, is through credit card. Um, and that's uh, through the enrollment services office that is the only uh, acceptable payment for right now. Um, right, so if you just, if you pay the bank, it won't actually go towards um, your, uh, your deposit amount. Um, so what you can either do is um, you can choose to pay an additional $500 if you wanted through credit card, and then both those amounts would be credited towards your tuition. Or what you can do is you can email info.accounts um, at utoronto.ca um, and you can ask them if, it, if there's a way to transfer that towards the deposit payment. Um, but because tuition is handled through the enrollment services office, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do on our end to transfer it. So you would have to contact enrollment services directly or student, the student accounts office directly um, to see if they would be able to transfer that amount over to um, count towards the tuition or sorry the deposit amount and then moving forward you would be able to pay your tuition through the regular um, payment method through the bank it's just the deposit that the, that can't be done um, through the bank okay so next slide um so you will be getting a full tutorial on how to use Acorn. Um, so in this summer, which again, I'll talk about in a few slides later, we on July 10th, we're going to be having a getting started event. And at this getting started event, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, your um, how to navigate and use your Acorn account. So how to enroll in courses um, and all that fun stuff. Um, but in order to, to access your Acorn account, um, you must enable your join ID and create a password for it um, before uh, arriving on campus. So your join ID will not work until you enable it or create a password for it. Um, so if you um, are missing your join ID. So your join ID was sent to you um, once you've applied to the program, the School of Graduate Studies um, would have sent you an email that has your join ID number on it. If you can't find that email, um, you will have to um, contact the School of Graduate Studies, so admissions.sgs at utoronto.ca, um, and they'll be able to provide you with your join ID. Um, so when you do begin your studies at U of T, your join ID will become your UTOR ID, um, which will allow you access to a number of different services, resources, um, Acorn account, Corcus, and so on. Um, Corcus is the university's student portal and learning management system. Um, so the admissions hub that we've been talking about is uh, used through Corcus, so you can kind of get an idea of how it works for when you start as a student. Um, so just make sure um, you you enable your, um, your join ID to be able to access Acorn. Okay, so you would have received an email from me yesterday regarding um, some housing options. Again, you will need your join ID um, to access the housing portal. Um, the email I sent yesterday was um, with regards to grad house. Um, so there were each department, each, each graduate department has a certain number of allotted spaces um, for students, um, incoming students. And so we have eight spaces um, for faculty of information students. Um, so those eight spaces have um, already been filled, but don't worry if you didn't send me an email and you're still interested in grad house, spaces open up throughout the summer. Um, so you would still just apply through the regular application process. Um, so let me just get you. Um, oh, the website's up there. Um, so gradhouse.utoronto.ca is where you'd be able to find the application to apply for Gradhouse if that's one of the um, living um, housing options that you're you're considering. Um, they 
they have um, sent an update. So Grad House did just send an update to us yesterday, um, and they have many space many spaces available um, in the summer for early move-ins. So if there are any students who are interested in moving in during June or July, um, you will receive priority residence over students who can only move in during September. Um, so in this case, interested students are encouraged to submit the 2021-2022 application, and you would indicate your um, preferred early move-in date on your application, um, and then you would be given first priority over that. But there are some alternate housing options available as well. Um, so you can find more options through studentlife.utoronto.ca um, slash HS. And then there are also some off-campus housing options that are also available um, that you can look into. I skipped a whole bunch of slides. Okay, um, save the date. So as I mentioned, we will be having our getting started event um, on Saturday, July 10th. Um, so this event is going to be, a, it's a virtual session. Um, and so at this event, we're gonna explain the enrollment process to you. Enrollment starts at the end of July. So there's nothing you need to worry about right now with regards to enrolling in your courses. Um, you will, um, be attending this event on July 10th, or if you can't attend the event, we will share the resources and the recordings with you afterwards, as we typically do. Um, but at, again, we'll explain the enrollment process, how to enroll in courses, what courses you should be enrolling in. Um, you'll have the opportunity to meet some of our faculty and our students and our staff, um, our student services staff, um, and you'll learn everything that you need to know to help prepare you for the start of the school year and for your enrollment date. So the um, fall winter 2021-2022 uh, uh, timetable will be available if, in um, early July. Um, so there'll be plenty of time for you to be able to um, plan out your courses. You can um, add courses to your ACORN cart that you think you might be interested in starting um, at the beginning of July when the timetable um, comes out and then you'll be ready for the July 10th event as well as for your enrollment window when it opens at the end of July. So don't worry about that right now. Um, I get a lot of questions about your status. Right now you should see an invited status, not a registered status. So you, this means the invited status is you're invited to enroll in courses and this is the initial status after being admitted. Um, so there isn't anything wrong if you're seeing an invited status, that's what you should be uh, should be seeing right now. Your status will change to registered um, automatically after you've paid or deferred your tuition fees. Um, and your invoice will be available through your ACORN account in July. So now I want to just kind of go through a little bit about where you can find some more information about, um, just really quickly, again, we're gonna go through this in more detail um, at the Getting Started event, just really quickly, if you want to kind of get an idea of where to find information about um, um, your courses and the course requirements um, and the required course for each of the concentrations and programs. So if you go over to the current students, so iSchool.utoronto.ca, over to the current students tab, and you click on programs and courses. Um, here's where you'll find the course timetables when it is available and all of our courses that are available. But if you go on to programs of study, and you click on, we'll just start with the MI program for now. Um, you'll find a list of our concentrations. And so when you click on the specific concentration, you'll be able to see an introduction about what the archives and records management concentration is, but you'll also be able to see what the required courses are for that specific uh, concentration. Um, and so in order to complete the MI degree, you do need to complete 16 half courses. Um, and these courses are the required courses that, are, that you will need to complete. And then the rest of them would just be your elective courses, which can be taken um, in any other concentration um, that is available. So we do encourage you to take courses um, within 
you know, different concentrations and to, you know, go outside your comfort zone um, and take courses that you wouldn't have maybe otherwise thought of taking before. Um, so again, you can just go onto this specific site um, and you could, um, on the specific concentration you're interested in and see what kind of uh, required courses there are there. Um, and it has more information there as well. And then if you go over to the Masters of Museum Studies, it's the same thing. So you'll be able to see a list of the required courses for there as well. All right. So collaborative specializations is the next slide there. Okay. Um, so I've spoken a lot about the collaborative specializations at past events as well as in the new student newsletter. Um, and here, these are partnerships that we have with other departments at the University of Toronto. So if there are any collaborative specializations that you're interested in, you will need to submit a separate application for them. So you do have to be admitted to one of the um, graduate programs, so within the MI or the MMST program, um, in order to be eligible for a collaborative specialization. Um, so what it does, it doesn't add any extra time to your degree. It just means that the courses you're going to be taking um, as your electives would be geared towards that specific specialization. And so when you graduate, you'll be graduating with your MI or MMST degree, as well as a specialization in any of the collaborative specializations that you're interested in. Um, so a, a lot of them have ongoing deadlines, so you can apply to them at any time um, throughout your degree. Um, and then some of them do have specific deadlines that you do need to follow. Um, so it's nothing, you don't have to apply for them now if you don't want to. You don't have to start in your first year if you don't want to. Um, you can always add a collaborative specialization um, throughout your degree as well. Again, because a lot of them do have ongoing uh, um, admissions deadlines. Um, so you'll want to go on to the specific website for that specific collaborative specialization you're interested in to find out what those admission requirements and procedures are. Okay, so paying tuition. Um, so all students must pay the minimum degree fee, which is equivalent to two years of full-time fees for both the MI and the museum studies degrees. Um, tuition fees are charged by program, not by individual course, regardless of how quickly or slowly you take to complete the program. Um, so in order to be fully registered, your tuition for the fall term is due on August 27th, and the fee schedule will be released um, usually mid-July is when the School of Graduate Studies will release them. Um, so if by the time all of your degree requirements have been successfully completed and you've paid less than what it would have cost for you to complete a full-time degree, then you will have to pay a balance of degree fee, which will be the remaining amount of tuition owing. So just keep that in mind. So if you finish earlier, it doesn't mean your tuition is less. It just means that by the time you graduate, um, you will have a balance of degree fee and that's going to be the remaining amount of tuition owing. And as I mentioned before, the iSchool considers you registered after you've either paid or deferred your tuition fees. And we can talk about the, the you know, deferred tuition fees um, again at the July event. So it's nothing you need to worry about right now. Um, so students in professional master's programs, including the Master's of Information, typically fund their educational expenses through a variety of different programs. So I've broken it down into three general categories to try and make it a bit easier to understand. So financial aid, words and scholarships, and employment. Um, so first with financial aid, um, most of our students do receive OSAP or some other form of government loan if you are outside of Ontario. Um, so for students receiving OSAP, your fin financial need information will be sent to us directly. Um, but for students who are receiving an out-of-province student loan, you will need to complete the out-of-province financial aid application form that can be found on our website to be eligible for other financial assistance. We also have what's called a PMFA, and this is a grant, and it attempts to fill a portion of the financial gap 
for full-time students who receive the maximum amount of government financial aid available, but whose funding doesn't cover all of the tuition cost. So there is some a, a little bit of funding that is available or can be available uh, to you if needed. Emergency grants are also available. So if you do encounter an unexpected emergency situation, like your house flooded or you lost your apartment or you can't you know, pay for food or month's rent, um, we do, you can apply for an emergency grant. Uh, students with permanent disabilities, you may receive funds through the Canada Student Grant for persons with permanent disabilities as part of your OSAP funding. But in addition, grants are also available through the Ontario Bursary for Students with Disabilities, as well as the Canada Student Grant for Services and Equipment for Persons with Permanent Disabilities. Um, and this will help with disability-related supports and ser services. Um, so the next category is awards and scholarships. So applicants can apply for an external government award. So um, the OGS and SHRC, um, the deadline has passed for this year. Um, but however, you are still able to apply for an OGS or a SHRC award or one of those external government awards um, in your first year to receive for your second year of study. So don't worry if you've missed the deadline this year, um, but it's just, it's important that you do pay attention to the deadlines because they are pretty early. Um, so for example, um, the OGS deadline um, was December 1st. I'm sorry, the SHRC deadline was de December 1st and the OGS deadline um, was March 1st, I believe. Um, March 1st, I think that was the date. Um, but they, they are early, so just make sure you are paying attention to it if you are gonna apply for your second year. Then there are other um, School of Graduate Studies or uh, University of Toronto awards that you'll want to look into. Um, so if you go onto the specific um, SGS or U of T website under future students and financial matters, you'll be able to see uh, um, other scholarships that you should be considering as well. Um, and the um, Omnibus Awards application will open up on August 1st. And the deadline is September 30th. So if you go onto our website, this general, we've created a general timeline. Let's open up the link here. Oops, there you go. Um, so we created a general timeline for things, important things to keep an eye out, out for throughout the year. Um, so financial awards. So if you go on to awards, um, you'll be able to see a list of um, awards that are available for you to apply to. Um, and then the omnibus application will also be available here. So the application will be able to will be accessed here um, starting August 1st. And this will give you access to all of these other scholarships and awards. Um, that you may be eligible for. So you can have a look at some of the options that are available, um, some of what the requirements are, um, and kind of have a look at, at what some of those options are for you. That presentation. Okay. And then finally, employment. Um, so many of our students do work part-time while studying. The work-study program is a great option, and these are on-campus jobs, and it's really convenient because you're already on campus, and you can work between um, or after class whenever it's convenient for you. And these applications will open in early August, and you will be notified in the new student newsletter as well. Um, and here are just a few websites that you should also pay attention to uh, throughout the year or throughout the summer. Um, so we will have some updates on the COVID situation found on our website. Um, we will be updating this website monthly. So make sure you are paying attention to that website. The university also has um, their updates as well. So pay attention to the university updates um, through here. And then, oops. Um, you'll, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you'll be able to find all of this information as well through the monthly new student newsletter. So please pay attention to that newsletter as all the resources will be available there to help prepare you for the start of class. <clears throat> I also have drop-in hours every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 
Um, so feel free to drop in anytime to chat, say hi, um, and ask any of your questions through there as well. So that's all from me. I'm now going to pass it on over to uh, Nicole, who's going to take us through a virtual tour of the iSchool. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Oops. Okay, sounds good. I'm um, sorry, just give me a moment. I'm just going to share my screen. All right, perfect. Well, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Nicole. I just finished my undergraduate studies at the University of Toronto. So I'm very excited to show you the tour of the Bissell building. Um, so this tour, obviously, it only covers a portion of your life at the University of Toronto, but um, I'm pleased to show you more about the Bissell building. This is the home of the Faculty of Information and this is where most of your classes would be. So um, lots of your courses, your concentration, you would find it over here. So we're gonna make our way with the seventh floor. Um, it's a very top floor of the Bissell building as well. You can see incredible views from the city as you can see here. Um, so for master students, your TAs will actually be iSchool PhD students. And um, on the seventh floor, there's actually some uh, offices and lounges for PhD students. However, uh, as a student, the rest of the floor is yours. Um, key fobs are only given to current iSchool students and faculty. So those outside of the faculty won't have access to this floor. And this key fob actually gives you 24 access to 24 hour access to Vessel and to the classrooms and the building as well. So here's a kitchen. Um, this is where we have access to a microwave, sink and fridges. And I know for commuters especially, it's very important. So it's really great to have your own area within your department. And for this reason, we also have a student lounge as well. Um, this is a great place for group meetings to study, eat in between classes, or to simply just distress and relax. Um, iSchool and U of T as a whole has a really large commuter population. So um, I know myself, I used to commute to U of T every single day. So it's a really great place uh, to have a personal space for master students uh, to hang out, or if you have to stick around at the end of the day and you can't go home easily. <laughs> um, so the lounge is great as well. Um, I know students use the space to use their meals or to study or simply chat. Um, Sorry, let me just rewind that a bit. All right, so this desk area actually turns into a meeting space and um, it's used for many of the associations that we have here at iSchool, such as the Master's Information Student Council, MISC, or MUSA as well, the Master's of Museum Study Student Association. Um, so we have various associations of student chapters. We have the Association of Canadian Archivists and also Librarians Without Borders as well. And you'll have the opportunity to actually learn more about these on the annual club days that we have at the beginning of the year. So within the student lounge as well, we also have an extra set of microwave, fridge, and a kettle. So overall, this floor is really great and commuter friendly. We're gonna make we're gonna make our way to the sixth floor now. This is actually where the vast majority of faculty members have their own offices. Um, our faculty actually come from all over the world, so you really do get a diverse um, academic and cultural background. Um, it is kind of a bit of a maze at first, but each office is carefully labeled. If you do want to talk to your profs about something, this will probably be where you will catch them. Um, we also have the MISC and MISA offices here as well. But that's pretty much it for the fifth floor. We're going to make our way over to the fifth floor. Sorry. Um, so this is actually the second floor of the Inform. The Inform essentially is the learning commons here at the University of Toronto. Um, at the iSchool, and it's reserved only for Faculty of Information students. Essentially, it's both a physical and a virtual space where users, resources, and services are brought here together. Not sure if you can see, but peeking through those glass doors, um, there's actually various class projects that are actually put there. Um, so we have this wall space that it's frequently used by other classmates, and it's a great way to see what your classmates and what other people from different concentrations are doing um, in other classes. And we also have a seating area here, and there's also study spaces that are bookable at the inform desk, and they're frequently used by students before and after class, uh, classes in the classrooms on the floor. Um, as you saw there, we're in room 538. We actually have three classrooms here. We have 507 and 538 being one of the larger classrooms, and 520 is more of a seminar room, um, and it's frequently used by PhD students as well. 
So actually, um, the second fl floor of the forum also is really in high demand because it has these individual study pods. Um, I'm not sure if you can really see, but they're very comfortable. <laughs> um, they have outlets, they have a lamp, they have a table, and they have a footrest. Um, it's honestly perfect for students because you can study on your own and you can have your own alone space within the library. So it's really great overall. Uh, so this is actually the first floor of the forum. Uh, the space has lots of workspace for students. It's not really like a typical library where it's always quiet. It honestly depends on what is going on at that time. Um, and it's also used for various showcases as well for class projects and other events. If you do need a quieter workspace, we have three um, we have three, three places where you could book as well. Um, there's three rooms that are in the informed desk. And the informed staff overall are really helpful. And the student services staff is also on this floor. So what's really cool actually is that when you can pay for your tuition, you actually contribute to something that's known as the MISC and MUSA Tech Fund. And this essentially gives you the ability to check out technology the way you check out a, a library book. It's really cool because if you need anything from a laptop, podcasting equipment, or even chargers, you're 100% covered. Um, and if there's something that you think would be beneficial to your studies, you can definitely make requests for specific technology as well. So we actually have our maker space uh, right over here. <laughs> All right. Um, and it has things such as 3D printers and sewing machines, and it can be used by all iSchool students. Um, it's actually a part of a KDMI semaphore project, and it's basically aimed at exploring, critiquing, and informing the design of technological device, media, and systems. And it's partnered with a collaborative specialization in knowledge media design. All right, we're gonna make our way over to the third floor. Um, this floor holds most of our classrooms and it's also where our iSchools workshops actually take place. Um, so I wanna take this time to talk to you more about our iSchools workshops. Actually, they're workshops that offer academic, professional and practical skills, and they could actually apply directly to your studies or to your career after your graduation. Um, so we actually offer a variety of, of topics from how to create a quality resume to how to uh, create Python or use Python. Um, and they're really in high demand throughout the year. So I highly recommend to take access of those in the beginning of the semester. We're gonna make our way to the first floor. This floor typically has lockers um, and these can actually be rented throughout the semester. So that especially in the summer, you don't have to carry your coat around or wear your snow boots. Um, and it's really great, especially if you're commuting. We have the UX lab over here, um, and it's equipped with a particular learning style actually that is used by students in UX design classes. Um, so it is only open to students in UX design classes, but even if you're not taking the UX concentration, um, if say if you're using, say if you're taking a course in UX design that semester, your key fob will actually give you access during that semester. So it's really great because it's equipped, equipped for the particular learning style. Um, so in the second floor, this is actually the main entrance for the Bissell building. Um, it's a lobby here. It also has our largest classroom, room 205. Um, when you walk in, you'll usually see the offices for the dean, the assistant dean, and our admissions and recruitment team. And this is a tail lab. This is the newest addition to the iSchool. It's also specifically designed for the UX design concentration. The screens on the wall are touchscreen and you're able to use Bluetooth to connect your phone, tablet, or computer to the screen to project any files directly onto the screen. Um, so that's pretty much it for the tour. I hope you did learn a bit. Like I said, it's only a small portion of your life relevant to the University of Toronto. And hopefully we're excited to see you in the upcoming semester. All right, that's all for me. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Nicole. Oops. Okay, um, so now, so now um, I'm going to pass it on to our um, amazing current students and we're gonna have our student panel now and they're all gonna introduce um, themselves. Um, and so then after this, we will be able to break out into um, 
uh, smaller groups and you'll, you'll be able to, again, have a lot of your questions answered. Um, and as Stephanie mentioned, I believe I have a, have a slide that I'll be talking about orientation uh, a little later, um, but we'll also be ho holding um, or hosting iSchool workshops um, throughout the summer. So again, yeah, definitely please pay attention to the new student newsletter, which will have more information about that. Um, so now I'm going to pass it on to Jordan, um, who's going to be the moderator for today's panel. Thank you, Andrea. Hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Vetter, and I recently completed my second year of the Master of Museum Studies program and will be convocating in June. Very exciting. Um, you can see behind me, actually, my background is of the Inforum, which you just saw in the video. Um, so I will be moderating our student panel for today. Very excited to have fellow students here to share some of their experiences at the iSchool with you and hopefully give you some insights into what student life here is like. So we do have a few questions prepared and we will go through the panelists in alphabetical order so you know what order to expect. Um, I'll call on you when it's your turn and you can turn on your mics, um, but then we will open it up at the end for some general questions for those of you in the audience. Um, so to start us off, we'll do quick introductions of each panelist. So if you could share your name, uh, your what year you're in at the iSchool, your current program or concentration if applicable, and any of your academic background prior to attending the iSchool. So we will start with Ariana. Hi everyone, my name is Ariana. Um, I am currently finishing off my first year of the UXD concentration. I'm currently the co-op program. Um, and before this, um, I was at the University of Waterloo and in the Global Business and Digital Arts program. That's where it's my bachelor's. Amazing. Welcome. And Courtney? Hi, I'm Courtney DeMere. Um, I just finished my first year as a Master of Information in Archive Record Management and Critical Information Policy Studies. Um, I'm actually taking summer courses, so I guess I'm still technically first year by a that and in the past uh i guess i didn't have like a normal history like i originally started political science economics that i was going to go with that then took time off for personal reasons and th then went back to finish my undergrad in history amazing um morgan well, hi everyone so i'm morgan basile and i'm doing the master of information in the library and information science program and I'm finishing my first year. I'm taking a couple courses this summer. And I have an undergraduate degree in communications from Mount Royal College, which I did 14 years ago. So I'm back at school to my master's. So it's never too late, everybody. Thank you. Excellent. And we have Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm just finishing my first year of the Master of Museum Studies program. Um, and before starting this program, I just finished my undergrad at U of T. I did a double major in French linguistics and Near and Middle Eastern civilizations and a minor in English, which is a mouthful to say. Amazing. And my apologies, I missed one other panelist. Uh, so we also have Andrew here as well, who can introduce himself. Hi, everybody. So my name is Andrew. I did my are currently in uh, information systems and design and human centered data science. I just finished my first year. I'm also taking a summer course right now. And my academic background is I did a undergraduate degree in uh, business at Lincoln University in Thunder Bay with a focus in information systems. Awesome. So many different backgrounds. So thank you all for being here. And now I'd like to know from each of you, why did you choose the iSchool? Was it uh, whether your program choice or something that drew you to the campus or the university itself? What was it that led you to apply and to accept your uh, degree at the iSchool? And we'll start with Andrew this time, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, so actually, I when I was finishing up my undergraduate degree, I actually was looking at a couple of master's options. And then I was originally planning to just do more of like a general program. And then one of my professors had was planning to go teach at the iSchool doing one of the workshops and he recommended me I check it out and I actually had no idea what it was even when I was like trying to search for programs and I'm glad he definitely recommended it because it was definitely exactly what I was looking for but I didn't even know it existed so it's definitely like a great program and uh, highly recommend it for all you guys that got accepted so he made the right choice. Excellent, Ariana. 
Uh, it was a mix of reasons. Um, one was I actually had the pleasure of like having um, Olivier as one of our guest lecturers while I was at UW. Um, I also come from Toronto, so living at home was something that I was interested in. And also just build, being able to build connections in Toronto, just because I spent the last four years in Waterloo was something really important. Thank you. Courtney? When I was looking into master programs, I actually came across the master of information pretty early on, which made me really excited because I didn't want to focus in library studies, which I think most schools focus on. No offense to the people who love libraries. I just, not for me for all the time. Um, and so I took interest in that. And then when I looked further into like the available courses to like how I could diversify my own interests, um, I thought it was like a good fit. Thank you. And Morgan? Yeah, so I, I had applied for library school at uh, UBC and at Western, but uh, U of T's outreach and communications was far superior to the other schools. They really won me over. Um, they did a, the iSchool team did a great job making me feel welcome, and they were always prompt and helpful in answering my questions. And also U of T's library program is rated number one in Canada, and it's real. The quality of teaching is world class. Very true. And now Sarah. Um, for me, I actually applied to a couple of different museum studies programs. Um, one was college level, one was abroad, and then I applied to U of T. Um, but ultimately I chose to come to the I school for, first of all, practical, practical experience with the internship in between the two years of the program. Um, and also just the coursework seemed more aligned with what I was hoping to get out of my museum studies. Amazing, yeah, a good a variety of answers and there are many different reasons why the iSchool can be a good fit for students. Um, so now we have gone through a very different year being online and for some of us never having even set foot on campus for classes, um, but there's always so much that happens in a year at the iSchool. So for our panelists, can you share with the audience what has been both your most challenging moment at the iSchool so far, as well as your most rewarding moment? And we'll start with Andrew again. Yeah, for sure. So definitely rewarding, I'd say like the flexibility of being able to work anywhere. So you can like wake up in the morning, do attend your lecture from your bed if you really wanted to, or on the go anywhere. And you really have access to do anything like from anywhere you'd like. So it's definitely nice to have like your own little setup at home with two monitors taking notes and whatnot. And in terms of challenging, I'd say probably is managing group work. I you know at first semester, some classes I had were group mates in different time zones. So it was a little tricky, but for the most part, I know in second semester, we had talked to some of the professors and asked them if we could try to accommodate them and get people in groups in the, that were in the same time zone and definitely helped alleviate those issues. Because when you can only have like a certain couple few hours that overlap that you're both awake, it's uh, it makes it a little tough to work together. So, but it wasn't the yeah, end of the world, obviously you still got things done. It was just a little bit of a challenge, which mean in the business world will happen. So it's a good practice in the long run. Awesome, great problem solving. Uh, Ariana. Um, I think the most rewarding experience that I've had so far um, I mean, the professors have done, at least for the UXD pro program, um, they've done a really good job of trying to translate everything to online. And one of the things that has maintained is that um, for your core, your introductory um, UXD course, um, Olivier invites um, experts in, in the field to like listen to your presentations that you make like every other week, which is absolutely daunting, but like kind of getting that feedback and even in some cases like praise for some of the work that you was doing was super, like just super validating. Um, as for most challenging moment, I think um, just trying to build connections with other students, um, especially, you know, it's a rough year. Um, I'm also like the one of the social committee chairs I was reelected and, you know, trying to get people to sort of find ways to connect is difficult. You know, you spend all of your time on the computer. The last thing you want to do is spend more time on the computer to talk to more people. Um, but it's been it's also been an interesting um, challenge to sort of experiment with as well and try to figure out how to build a connection for the school. Definitely. Um, and now we move to Courtney. 
Yeah, so one of my biggest challenges was like navigating all the technical aspects of our platforms in the first like month or two when it's still like really new to you. It's one thing to like go through it once, but then another thing to actively have to use it and find out like months later, oh, there's another function. I wish I would have known that. Um, <laughs> you learn from it and you get better as time goes on. But yeah, the, the beginning was... It, it, it didn't help that you couldn't just go to someone's office like here can you just show me how to go through it it's the well you can tell me how to do it but I can't really see it so well um I guess one of the rewarding things is how I learned more about like I kind of knew what I wanted to do going in but like the more I'm here and the more classes I take the more I can like say no I'm not interested in this aspect but I find this like really intriguing and so I found more of like myself and like what I want to do going forward that's great. Always lots to learn. And Morgan. Uh, so my most rewarding moment has been realizing that even though I've been out of school for 13 years, I belong here and I'm doing well. Um, the support you get at U of T is truly awesome. I admit I had imposter syndrome, but the feedback I've gotten from my professors and my peers has really helped to overcome my fears. And I'm starting, I'm truly thriving in the grad school environment. Uh, the most challenging moment I've experienced is that some classes, like uh, collection development, for example, are truly rigorous in workload, but totally worth it for the knowledge and experience you gain. Great. Thank you for sharing. And Sarah? I think for me, one of the most challenging aspects of the Museum Studies program is that it's a lot more well, it's good that it is, but it's a lot more like career focused than your undergrad is. So you see like the good things about the, the sector that you're going into, but you also see some of the less great things. Um, but on the other hand, it is good to be prepared for what you're getting into in the future. Um, and the most rewarding part, I would say, I would say two things have been really rewarding, like finding people in the program who are like minded, like I have never met such a large group of people who like so many of the same things that I do, like who knew that would happen in a, in a very specific master's program, uh, but also being in classes and learning about things and like being able to see myself doing this as a career has been like wonderful so far. That's awesome. Thank you all for sharing those moments. And it's great that there are lessons that we can always learn and meet new people. And even in strange environments, um, there are good things to celebrate. Um, so you likely uh, all have very different schedules and no two days are the same. And of course, the online environment has probably thrown a wrench into how we do some of our work. Um, but could you all describe what an average day in the life might look like for you as you go through your studies and any other work or other activities that you have on your plate? Andrew, you can start. Yeah, for sure. So I normally have like four classes in total, and then they typically are either three hours. I think there's one that was two hours. So most of the time, you'd like to spread them out throughout the week. So I normally get at least one or two days off during the week. And that leaves like plenty of time, obviously, for like reading and other like things you have to do for each class. And then also leaves plenty of time, obviously, for spending time with friends and family. And then I also worked a part time job with very flexible hours, thankfully, for, that I also could work from home. So I could fit those hours in when I didn't have classes. And it just gives obviously a good quality of life, too, because it was it's not like too demanding. But you get all of the, like hands on experience that you really need to kind of gain the valuable knowledge that you are hoping to learn from this program. That's great. Thank you, Ariana. So full disclosure, uh, in times of crisis, I like to load up my schedule. And since the pandemic has been going on for over a year, my schedule has been pretty packed. Um, in terms of my academic life, I would have to describe it as probably 40% of my time is spent like in classes, maybe, and the rest of, the, of my time online is spent in group work. If you're in ever taking any UXD courses, there is a lot of collaboration. So um, yeah, a lot of my time is spent in group meetings. I was working part-time and like Andrew, I was lucky to be um, with an employer who was understanding and was a, would allow me to sort of work um, flexible hours. On top of that, I have like weekly stand, standing meetings um, as part of the social committee. Um, I also do other things outside of 
um, the UI school to sort of enrich my experience. So I'm part of Civic Tech Toronto, um, which is like a hub that works on civic problems for fun um, and for no money. And I also run an acapella group. Amazing, so many things to keep you busy, Courtney. Like Ariana, my life is pretty busy. Um, this is why I like planning and scheduling so that I can have downtime and I can actually enjoy it instead of thinking, oh, well, something's due later this week. I was like, I can deal with that later, it's planned. Um, I usually take three or four courses just because of how much I do. I'll admit I enjoy three better. It's a, a lot more manageable for me. Um, that gives me also time to do my read-ins, any projects, some of which are like bigger projects. And I have some classes that are like weekly. And so they have like different demands. Um, I also work. And then I volunteer once a month at a museum. Um, I try to take part in workshops and panels, whether it's offered by the school or um, affiliated associations. Um, there's actually some recommended associations under the concentration on the iSchool sites. I really recommend it. There's some really good sources and you can meet a lot of great people in your fields and with your interest. Um, and then I'm also part of the student council right now. So right now there's a lot of chaos going around trying to make sure everyone is um, and to try to plan going forward. And awesome. that is, yeah. Great, thanks for sharing. And Morgan. All right, um, so fun fact, everybody. Um, I've only been, I've never been to the U of T campus and I've only been to the airport in Toronto once. But despite all that, the iSchool did an amazing job of making virtual experience um, world-class. So when you're at the iSchool, you, I'm not gonna mince words here, you build your life around school. It's intense, it's quite rigorous, but you're gonna do great. Um, so typical day, um, I'll attend the iSkills workshop or webinar on Zoom. I'll volunteer creating articles and organizing data on Wiki, um, chatting with my peers on Discord, or have fun playing games or watching movies with the different clubs and groups you can join. Um, there's never a shortage of things to do. Your email will always be pinging with invitations and opportunities and um, really try to stay, read those newsletters that come in because there's all sorts of things that you can miss. They just, they come fast and furious, but you'll never be bored, promise. <laughs> that is very true. And finally, Sarah. Um, for me, I would definitely say, well, you spend like three hours in a class, but for me, I've definitely spent more time doing work for class outside of that three hours for each class a week, like doing readings, working on assignments, all that fun stuff. Um, I'm also on MUSA, which is the Museum Study Student Association. I am the social media manager, which is fun. Uh, we have like one meeting a month and then meetings here and there for other committees. And this year I was also working a part-time job that was like super flexible with how I did my hours. I was able to do them whenever I wanted kind of. Uh, so even around all of the readings, and assignments and classes, I was still able to fit in things I wanted to do. Um, yeah, so yeah, definitely busy, but there are lots of ways to find balance. Awesome. Yes, also different schedules, but as you can see, there is a lot to get involved in if you're interested, um, and also making sure that you are taking time for yourself and doing things that you enjoy. Um, so now for those in the audience that have, are looking to accept their offers in the fall and potentially still considering, as panelists, now that you have either a year or two under your belt, could you share one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you started the program? Andrew. Yeah, so for me, I would say it would be almost like that fear you have of like asking like a question that might be like inferior to the knowledge you think everyone else has. So like I know in like the second semester more so when you like kind of meet people and like talk to them more, you'd be like talking while or chatting with each other during a class and one of them would be like, oh, do you like have a, this question? And we're like, yeah, I don't know that. And then you post it in the, the chat and then the teacher reads it out and like obviously explains it to everyone and like it's going to help more than just you. Like don't be afraid really to ask questions because for the most part, everyone's like, 
in most or in the same like level of knowledge as you. So even if you have a question that maybe sound like it's not not too complicated, then you should really know it. More than likely, you aren't the only one in that situation. So really, just asking questions and creates like that discussion and could really maybe even help another question that someone else has. So don't be afraid to ask out or ask questions or reach out to any resources that you have. That's great. Thank you, Ariana. Um. This is something that like I knew, but I didn't truly understand until I came into the high school. And that is that everybody comes in from such diverse backgrounds. It's really easy to feel, especially if you come from a more specific bachelor's program. Like for example, mine, like a lot of people, you were kind of like, you're either a design person, a business person, or like a CS person. And there was no other kinds of people. Whereas, you know, like in this faculty, Everybody is coming in from such a diverse range of backgrounds, different levels of experience. And, you know, if you're coming, if you're worried that, you know, you might not fit in because you don't, you know, maybe you're trans, you're like me and you're going into a concentration that's not necessarily what you studied as your undergrad, or you feel like you're not, you know, you're not suited for whatever you're studying. I would encourage you to keep an open mind. Um, you know, you you might surprise yourself and you should try not to feel that imposter syndrome because I know it's really hard. That's great, thank you. Uh, Courtney. Yeah, so I wish I would have known how much I would have loved certain topics. Um, I could then I would have taken research methods to keep my option open for a thesis, but I was so in my head like, no, 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 I don't want to do it. I, I just want to take a variety of courses, learn about a bunch of things. And I was like, oh, no, but I'm really touched about these topics. And then based on that, also um, certain courses don't run every year. So be sure to explore your options and take whatever you want so that you don't miss an opportunity. Yeah, that's great. We're good. I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, all right, so with the LIS stream that I'm doing, um, it's a lot of writing. Um, so I really wish before I started my program, I learned how to do APA style. Um, it was difficult juggling assignments, especially in the first semester when I was trying to also learn how to do citations and references. If you can take a workshop or just brush up on APA, um, before you start for the LIS program, you'll be ready to tackle all your assignments. It'd be a really good thing to do. That's great. And there is actually, an, or there was at least an iSkills workshop that I took about APA citation that was really useful. So definitely keep that one in mind. Uh, Sarah. Uh, for me, I wish I had known that it's a really like doing the Master Museum Studies is a really great time to explore your interests coming into it, I thought I knew what I wanted to do in museums, but then I've discovered like a whole other world of fun things I could possibly do. So I think I wish I, well, I found out pretty early, which was great, but I wish I'd known coming in that I didn't need to be like so dead set on something specific because there's so much to explore, so. That is very true. Thank you, everyone. And so now just one final question before we um, open up to more uh, general questions. If each panelist has one last piece of advice that you would like to share to future students. Andrew. I would say try to like plan your courses and what you actually want to take and like find your electives that like interest you or show your workshop classes that interest you right away and try to don't be like second guessing yourself because if you delay any bit of picking your courses it's uh it's tough to get into some courses that have very popular or demand as i know first i have many classmates i know that tell me like i was like oh are you taking this class They're like no i didn't sign up the first day so i didn't have the luxury of getting into that class so you always want to try to make sure you kind of plan ahead and really know like which courses that you're planning to take so that you can make sure that you enroll. But for the most part, I know like summer courses, I had, one of the classes I had changed my mind on, I got waitlisted on. I still they ended up putting everyone on the waitlist in the class. So it's definitely nice to see, but you do have a little bit of a uh, kind of second, you have to have like a plan B just in case, cause you never know. <laughs> awesome advice. Thanks, Andrew. And now Ariana. Uh, hmm. I guess this is more practical advice if you do get into the program or even like whatever, wherever you end up going. 
Um, this is something that I learned from Colin Furness, one of the professors here, which is that meetings are not for doing work. Um, if, you know, even though things are opening up, there is a chance that you might have a course or two online. If you do end up having to meet virtually, like try to spend that meeting time focusing on just aligning yourselves rather than on actually trying to sit there and do active work together. Um, it will greatly reduce Zoom fatigue um, by an amazing amount. I remember like my first couple of weeks having meetings that would last like four hours with my group mates and cutting them down to one. So please learn, please learn from me. That is very impressive. And I feel the same way about online meetings. Um, Courtney. My advice is just like to tailor things to yourself. Um, it's your education, it's your life. Um, you shouldn't have to like listen to so many expectations. It's here to cater for yourself. That includes knowing your limits. Don't like, you don't wanna overexert yourself, but you also do wanna take chances and opportunities. So make use to like our resources and feel free to reach out to make connections because you never know who you might meet. Very true. Thank you, Morgan. Um, I think if at all possible, try if you're in the library and information science program, try to get a job working in a library while you're going to high school. And this could be a talent position or a work study position or even volunteering. Um, I think gaining experience in a library setting will help you draw connections to your classwork. You'll be able to connect theory with praxis in a, in a compelling way. And these connections will provide the fodder you need to draw from to do your assignments and papers. Um, and then also just U of T, it's a wonderful place. Um, it's a great educational opportunity and you've made the right decision to come to the high school. Awesome, and Sarah. I think my biggest piece of advice for applicants and for students is to not forget to advocate for yourself, whether it's in class or elsewhere. It's really important if you feel like you're missing something or if you feel like something isn't being communicated to you, it's really important that you, especially in the online world, things can get lost in the cracks sometimes. It's really, really important if you think something is like not complete, if your information isn't completely complete <laughs> to ask someone about it. Um, so just to advocate for your needs. Awesome, very good advice from all of you. Thank you so much to our panelists. And as you can see, there are lots of unique experiences to be had at the iSchool, um, but you can find all of us in the breakout rooms to ask us more questions if you wish, and I will pass it back to Andrea. Great. Thank you all so very much. That was such wonderful advice that you all provided to um, our incoming class here. So thank you all for being here um, and for sharing your experiences with everybody. Um, so um, just because of time, I do want you to be able to have the opportunity to chat with um, each other and with some of our current students. So I think what we'll do instead is we'll actually um, head to the breakout rooms. But before I do that, we do have some other students that are here that I would just like to, if they could just quickly introduce themselves um, your name, um, what program or concentration you're in, and then we'll open up the breakout rooms and you'll have an opportunity to chat with um, everybody and we'll just go in order um, from uh, who's on the slide. <laughs> Rebecca, if you wanted to start. Yeah, sure, sorry. Are we supposed to be seeing a slide? Oh, do you not see a slide? Oh, I'm <laughs> no, so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Um, that would make sense. <laughs> Just one second. All good. Okay. Can you see it? Perfect. Yeah. Thank awesome. you. Perfect. Um, I'm Rebecca. Uh, I'm going into a second year of master's in museum studies, and I have a background in uh, history and classics. Natalie? Um. If Natalie is here, I have not made her. Oh, there she is. Okay, now she's a co-host. Thank you. I couldn't unmute myself before. <laughs> um, 
Hello everyone, my name is Natalie. I am a first year student in the Master Museum Studies program. Um, my background is in art history and museum studies. Hi everyone, I'm Olivia. I'm heading into my third year of the combined degree program. So I'm in the MI program with a concentration in archives and records management and the museum studies program. And I have a background in history and art history. Um, hello, I'm Yefimia. I'm finishing my first year in the Master of Museum Studies program, and I'm also doing a thesis. One second. <laughs> Is what I hear? Okay, Yasmin, you can speak. Oh, hi, sorry, I thought we were going in order. Um, hi everyone, I'm Yasmin. I've just finished my Master of Information with a concentration in critical information policy studies. Um, and I did my undergrad before this in political science, history and cinema studies. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Um, I don't see Shwet here either, but that's okay. Um, so we do have plenty of students for you to be able to talk with today. Um, so thank you all very, very much for attending um, today's um, today's event. Um, so listed here, you will see um, the different breakout rooms that are available. Um, actually, for the if you do have any questions for me, so if you have questions about your next steps or any career questions, um, there won't be a specific breakout room for that. Just come back to the main room. So I will be here in the main room and you can just come back to the main room anytime um, and you'll be able to ask me questions, um, administrative questions through there. Otherwise, please feel free to join any of the other groups that um, you want to know more about or chat with our students about um, that fit your interests. 